Thank you for joining us today for our panel on governance implementation projects. And uh, today we have a great panel uh, lined up. And uh, I'm just going to quickly just hand it off to our moderator for the panel, who is Kelsey Nabin. So Kelsey, please feel free to take it away. Hello, and thank you. Thank you for having me. So my name is Kelsey. I'm a researcher at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. I'm connected with the Centre for Automated Decision Making and Society, as well as the Blockchain Innovation Hub and Digital Ethnography Research Centre. So I have the pleasure of um, handing around the virtual room to introduce each of our panelists today and hopefully helping to facilitate a really engaging discussion on governance implementation and what's happening with DAOs in the blockchain space. So starting with Connor, please tell us a little bit more about yourself and um, what that has to do with DAOs. Thanks, Kelsey. Yeah, so um, formerly a lawyer, um, helped co-found the Blockchain Association back a few years ago, now biggest industry and lobbying association in the United States for blockchain. And on the DAO side, uh, really got it particularly interested when I wrote an article, Jesse Walden, around scaling crypto companies um, and looking to the, the precedent of cooperatives in order to think through some of the principles that we might apply in scaling crypto companies. And then thought more critically about uh, actually, how could we um, start having DAOs come together to jointly fund research and ultimately end up fund, uh, founding the DAO Research Cooperative, where we're doing just that. Excellent. Leighton. Yeah. Uh, well, no, Connor, I can say I've read that article. That was a really good article. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, my name is Leighton, and I am involved in a few different DAOs. Uh, Pool Together is one that I'm probably most heavily involved in. and That's a protocol that um, moved to tokenized governance in February of this year. So that's the one that I am still uh, most heavily involved in. But additional to that, I'm involved in a venture DAO, which is a on-chain, um, essentially angel investment group, and then a DAO called Pleaser DAO, which is a NFT art collection uh, DAO. So that's uh, that's my experience as it's relevant to DAOs. Great to have you here, Scott Moore. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Awesome. Hey everyone, my name is Scott. Um, currently, I'm a co-founder of a project called Gitcoin, which was started in 2017 with the goal of hopefully funding open source software development for the time being. That has meant mostly funding public goods in the Web3 ecosystem. And recently, we've exited to community towards that goal. Um, my history before Gitcoin actually involved a bit around DAOs in 2015-16 uh, with a project that uh, shortly after, unrelated to the DAO hack, ended up not really being very interesting as people sort of started to think more deeply about what we were trying to do with DAOs. And now it really feels like, um, although we're not there yet, there's definitely been, uh, there's been a lot of progress made, which is awesome. So excited to talk about that. And uh, Seth, um, I'll, I'll maybe pass it to you. Well, hi there, my name is Seth Fry. I'm a professor uh, at the University of California, Davis, and I specialize in the study of governance systems, mostly online governance systems like um, uh, World of Warcraft communities, uh, self-hosted Minecraft servers, um, uh, uh, subreddit, Reddit communities. Mm. Um, I was trained originally as a cognitive scientist to do cognitive science, to understand, you know, people, you need thousands or hundreds or, or maybe millions of people and you got to be able to compare them. So from my perspective to do social science, um, to study societies, you need a societal unit of analysis. You need an opportunity to study lots of independent instantiations of uh, communities or in my case, governance systems. And uh, and so the, the proliferation of DAOs and the, the very frothy um, high iteration um uh exploration that's happening in this community is a lot of what's brought me here today thanks look forward to exploring that more uh rich brown hi my name is rich brown i uh currently am the co-founder of the smart contract research forum uh it's a venue devoted to uh connecting researchers academics and industry together uh to push the space forward previously i was the head of community at maker dow for three four years uh, helped architect basically all the things that were uh, traditionally related to a community, but also a significant amount of time was spent uh, in the proto governance stage of MakerDAO. So I have some some insights into some of the mechanism designs there. Before that, I uh, co-founded uh, a cooperative, a multi-stakeholder cooperative in the real world, uh, as a normal a real business, with uh, fifteen hundred photographers, um, which is still running today. Uh, 
before that, I ran a 300 person pirate corporation in Eve Online, which Frey, you might, or Seth, you might have some insights into, uh, where I learned most of my community building skills, actually. I've just been coasting on those since then. So uh, that's, that's why I'm here. It's interesting that you should mention online cooperatives in relation to your kind of DAO resume. Uh, so why would or wouldn't communities want to consider a DAO? And why is it, uh, why is it now that blockchain communities are really kind of interested in investing in governance? So I, I definitely think that the, the metaverse sort of like conversation which we're sort of bringing up here with EVE Online and, and World of Warcraft and so forth is, is pretty relevant here. Like, especially during the pandemic, I think people started to really understand the reasoning behind the popularity of the sorts of organizations, um, which like this fringe sort of or roughly more fringe group earlier on already did. Um, I, I definitely also grew up sort of like playing World of Warcraft and like helped run guilds and, and raids and so forth. And that experience was like formative to the point where it, it didn't seem strange to me to like interact with a whole bunch of random people that I don't know online towards like some common goal. So the idea of like the Ethereum ecosystem never really seemed that strange to me. And it, it's interesting that like, it does seem strange where like part of the pandemic did seem strange to some people. But I think now there's a lot more understanding of the ability for people to coordinate online being like a, a core primitive of just like where we're at as a society. And I think that it's, it's naturally going to be a kind of thing that like progresses over time. We probably still have a lot of work to do in terms of like, you know, when we talk about people creating DAOs, the question is like, what is a DAO, right? And I, I don't think we're there yet in terms of really having like to, to something that Rich was saying just before we sort of started like a formal definition of like what a, or instantiation of what a digital cooperative should be in the future. But I think we're certainly making uh, a lot of progress there. And um, I think that the there's certainly been an acceleration just in this general idea of people coordinating online to like generate value being like a normalized thing. Um, the other last example of this very quickly mentioned is Roblox, which is like now obviously a public company, now obviously very popular. And like, even I think that's part of the reason we're seeing like traditional web two folks, like uh, even the standards of like DC Twitter folks, like now caring about this space. So um, I'll pause there, but that's, that's certainly been my, my journey, I guess. And it's, it's, I think to me, one of the reasons we're seeing uh, so much popularity in this concept now. I think, I think just jumping a little bit on, on Scott's thought, like, and you, you alluded to it as you were introing Kelsey, and we also heard Rich talk about his participation both in with um, online communities and then in, in cooperatives. Like it's, it just strikes me that a lot of this, a lot of the people who are interested, um, it's almost the perfect opportunity for people who are interested in cooperatives to collaborate with people who are interested in online communities, because both uh, different forums have so much important precedent um, to provide to those who are now thinking of setting up DAOs and also determining what DAOs are. I mean, I think we've all alluded to that. Like, there's no clear definition as to what a DAO is, and there's a lot of different thoughts about what that could be. And that is an incredible ambition, I think, of some of the take on that task to define DAO. Uh, in a way that's meaningful and important to the community. And I'm, I'm doing a thing right now with the DAO Research Cooperative where we're trying to identify some of the most pressing issues for DAOs, um, thinking broadly like legal issues, governance issues, treasury management issues. And in uh, a couple of the initial calls I had, that was the first thing that folks brought up. Like I'm talking to different leaders in the space and it's what is the definition of a DAO, whether it's um, related to the kinds of systems that a particular organization uses or the kinds of um, you know, obligations it has to its members or uh, a, a large variety of things. So when we think about why DAOs are popular, I think in part DAOs are popular because the de definition of DAO is so broad that anything is a DAO today. But we might see a, a fall off in popularity when we may, you know, start defining it more narrowly or at least uh, um, creating subcategories for DAOs. I don't want to put you on the spot, though, but can you get us started? What What is your definition of a DAO? What's your working definition when you're speaking to these Ooh, people? That's so tough. Um, I really don't want to dodge the question. I, I just think that we're at such an early stage of experimentation that we've yet to figure out what what a DAO is, candidly. And I know that's kind of a shady answer, but I was actually talking to we just a guy, a, a VC earlier today, and I was asking him about 
Um, you know, when you're talking to organizations that are looking, that you're looking to invest in and they intend to ultimately become DAOs or like Dexit, uh, um, how do you think about the way in which they're composing their DAO? How do you think about uh, the, their timeline for decentralizing into a DAO? And, and that was really his response is, you know, it, we're so early here that we actually don't even ask that question because we just don't think that someone could give us a serious answer. And candidly, I'm a little bit of the same mind. I was talking to Julia Rosenberg from Orca and she thought like very critically about this sort of stuff. And she was the first one to bring this up to me as, uh, as a big issue. And from her perspective, um, and I don't want to misquote her here, but she was talking about uh, uses of particular systems. So when I think about that, I would want, you know, a forum for proposals. I would want voting mechanisms. I wouldn't just want a telegram group. Um, and so to me, it maybe very broadly is an organization that allows for uh, decentralized governance, decentralized voting. But I would leave that very broad because I, I also have um, kind of a specific view on what members of a DAO should be able to vote for. And I'm not a huge believer in a kind of a one token governance system either. So what we define as DAOs broadly today, I may not totally agree with. And I imagine that's probably the same for most people on this call. I like that though, because I mean, at, at the moment, and we're talking about this process of, of how you get to a DAO, like the, the DEXIT um, acronym, so short for um, Exit to DAO, uh, which is a take on Nathan Schneider's Exit to Community. But they're not decentralized yet in many instantiations and they're not autonomous. They're kind of organizations. And I think a lot of the blockchain community is trying to figure out like, what is an organization? Um, Leighton, you mentioned a suite of DAOs that you're involved in. What's the varying mission or, or objective or goals of these different groups? Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, I draw two, like, th I draw one line very clearly in my DAO involvement. So pooled together, I, I almost, I wouldn't really call it a DAO, to be honest, <laughs> because to me, it's a protocol that has tokenized governance. And some people call those DAOs, but I don't think of those as DAOs like Compound, Uniswap, even Maker, like if you're familiar with these protocols pulled together, like I think of it as a protocol with tokenized governance, whereas Venture DAO and Pleaser DAO, because they both have DAO in the name, I think of those as DAOs. And the difference in my mind is like Venture DAO and Pleaser DAO are a group of people who came together to sort of like actively go do new things. Whereas pool together is like a protocol that was already established, already had hundreds of millions of dollars in it already was functioning. And the control was just given of an existing self-perpetuating project to the community. And I think that's like a very different thing than in my experience in like pleaser DAO and venture DAO is they immediately become very hierarchical. Um, but pool together is not. And it doesn't have to be because there's a very narrow space that like we're like making decisions about. And because we're not, we're not like debating like, you know, completely arbitrary subjects like we are in Pleasure DAO and Venture DAO. So that's, that's how I think of them differently, which I, you know, I'd be curious to hear Seth's input because I think uh, I would be curious how that maps to maybe like categories in, in a more academic sense, but that's at least from my personal experience. Um, let's see. Well, categories. Uh, so I, I actually, I think that I have something a bit akin to, to folks here. Um, th this uh, aversion even to defining a DAO, I think it's perfectly legitimate and, and uh, from my perspective, encouraged um, to end with definitions rather than start with them. To have uh, a word be the name of the thing you're trying to understand. It's consistent with a very uh, iterative, empirical kind of approach that sort of represent, you know, typical of the kind of experimentation uh, that we see here. And in line with that, um, all governance taxonomies that, that I encounter uh, in my work, um, I'd say uh, most of my you know, effort goes into, into trying to break them or push them. Um, and um, I'm still struggling. Uh, uh, um, as I, as you go across domains from a physical real world, um, let's say uh, nation state system, which is where a lot of our taxonomies come from to a small scale self-governing system. I actually um, uh, also got my start organizing uh, cooperatives and moved into the online space after that, because it's easier to do data science on. I'm originally in the, out of the housing co-op sector. Um, 
Uh, so taxonomies of small scale governance systems and then moving on to that into the emergent taxonomies of online communities, how they understand the differences between themselves. We are still not at a place where there's any kind of unified um, uh, uh, taxonomy or, uh, or ontology, I, I could say, of um, the axes along which governance systems vary. And so uh, I'm inclined to everyone's disappointment to come just as much uh, as, a, as a watcher and observer uh, than a holder forth. Have you been tempted to, so the, the co-op space has is, is been examined for the last four or 500 years, and there, there's a lot of subdivisions and categorizations and definitions there. Have you been tempted to sort of use those as templates to the new DAO ecosystem, or do you find that it doesn't translate? <laughs> Well, you know what? It's a really pleasant surprise to find so many people um, here um, coming with some kind of co-op background or interest. In, uh, um, you know, in, in my understanding, um, I'm still figuring out the kind of mapping of ideological backgrounds of, of people in this space to the subset of, of kind of blockchain applications that they, that they tap into. I do have one kind of litmus test I use for kind of knowing where to start talking to a person. Um, which is, uh, okay, visualize Utopia. It exists. Let's say Utopia exists and we're in it and it runs out of a building. Um, my question uh, for a lot of people tends to be, are there any people in the building? So is, is governance a system that runs itself or is it inevitably something that we're involved in that, that we use as a set of tools to govern ourselves, that we're active in the work of governance? And one kind of sense I'm getting already from at least uh, the folks uh, in, in this small circle is that a lot of you end up more in the idea that it doesn't run itself, that we're active in the acts of governance. So if anyone wants to not be pigeonholed by me, I'd love to. So that's helpful. And uh, to the point about uh, the name referring to autonomy or not, um, Aaron Wright recently said in a Stanford piece that there are two main types of DAOs, participatory and algorithmic. But really in what we've all described, there's both participation or it's not a DAO and there's also algorithms. So there's something happening through smart contracts and, and kind of um, automation there. So what are your views towards how much or what, I guess, what's being automated it's to Seth's point? Is it the people being automated out of the system or is it certain levels or functions kind of being automated to give autonomy to the people in the DAO? And then what does that actually mean? I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick answer on that. Cause I, so like the idea of social scalability, like Nick Sabo's essay on that from, I don't know, the late nineties was definitely a super influential piece on all my work I've done. And and what caught my attention about that piece is that basically his thesis is like smart contracts lower the cost of trust. And so what's being automated is, is the human trust that's required to broker relationships. And when you can lower trust, when you can lower the cost of trust of entering into new relationships, you can have more relationships. And I, I think the ideal world, you can have like an actually like a more flourishing social reality because you're able to be in more relationships with more different people groups because, um, because the trust, the need to, the, the trust is what's being, being automated. Um, so that's, that's my two cents on it. I definitely think that there is something to that notion. Like in particular, we like aren't very good, like um, Seth would know this much better than me, but like Dunbar's number is a really important concept here where like once you scale past 150 people, it's very difficult to actually have any idea of like who those people are, or, like to have a real like, find relationships with them. And I think what we sort of designed even beyond like the idea of DAOs, like in traditional structures is this idea of like, well, what if we put in like structures uh, around voting or around like what it means to participate in the system that are more formalized and less sort of like normative, I suppose. And those structures sort of act as scaffolding that allows us to more easily coordinate with like a larger group because there's like processes that we can all agree on, even if we don't necessarily like know each other and that like is the scaffolding into Layton's point that's like providing that trust layer. Um, and so historically that was very kind of uh, opaque. It was just like, okay, well, these people have sort of decided on these rules. And so I guess that's fine now. And now we can all abide by them. And, like we can trust these people and like the tower to decide what these these things are. And like in 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 theory, I wouldn't say necessarily in practice yet with DAOs where they are, 
that's sort of what we're to Layton's point automating. I would say just just kind of adding on to that and thinking about the way that different DAOs. Um, I, I really like the idea of trust, the trust created by smart contract contracts allowing for scalability, um, and even other tooling like just the governance mechanisms and even single token like in the in, in Uniswap or in Compound, for instance, the creation of grants programs. So grants programs are obviously there's a, a huge port, a huge part at least in those two organizations. There's a grants committee and they they make assessments about projects and then they decide to fund them or to not fund them. And so uh, there, but there was a, a vote done um, at initial stages as to whether or not those committees should be funded. And in looking at MakerDAO too, and I know Rich could speak more to this, but as I understand it, when MakerDAO decentralized or became a DAO and maybe left the foundation world, I, there might be other structural pieces I'm not totally familiar with there, but some of the functions were um, allocated to, to or assigned to new organizations. And so there were just different organizations under um, the treasury or the DAO, um, however you want to state it. And so you... Um, uh, members of the DAO, and this isn't specific to Maker, are able to make some decisions about allocating responsibility to other people. And this is potentially where the co-op structure becomes really important. As Rich mentioned, there's four or 500 years of, of exploration there. And so we appreciate that cooperatives have members, but the members don't make every single decision. They, uh, they assign decisions to management. And so in that same way, we're seeing assignment of different responsibilities, sometimes to organizations and at other times to potentially individuals and DAOs. It relates to something that Leighton was talking about earlier, where some DAOs are protocol management DAOs, and it's largely governance mechanisms around binary decision trees, basically. So we vote for this, we vote for that. Um, then there's engagements or creative, and the, the list goes on and on. But uh, from the co-op model, that you're kind of decentralizing or, or taking a committee model to a business unit. And so that's, that's one of the ways that these more complicated or to a business organization. That's why some of these more complicated organizations are able to, to uh, maintain themselves with more egalitarian decision-making processes, which in my mind kind of raises the question. Um, and, and you triggered me with the, the maker uh, question because as an organization becomes more and more complex and all of its decision-making responsibilities get spun out to the community, is there an upper limit on the complexity of, of a DAO? Is it possible to scale or are you sort of three steps past the protocol management level, then, you know, maybe it's time to look at a firm instead, or, or does this group believe that the DAOs can scale? That, the, so that, that's interesting that, cause for me, that brings up a little bit of a tension almost between where Rich is and where uh, Leighton Scott and Connor are. Um, uh, uh, for uh, among Leighton Scott and Connor, it sort of seemed like there's an understanding that the, um, that trust didn't used to be scalable and now it's scalable. Uh, but a little bit where Rich is coming from is, well, centralization is a great way to scale things. And because we have a background, you know, because society has a history of centralization, scale hasn't really been the problem. We have scalable trust. There's centrally managed mm. reputation systems. There's centrally managed currencies and, and centrally kind of architected engineered market economies. Uh, and so then, uh, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, is there a conflict here? Is there a proposal that a decentralized scheme is m uh, ultimately more scalable than a centralized scheme? Are we challenging the scalability of centralized schemes? Or as Rich is kind of uh, possibly indicating, uh, is, is the goal to get decentralized schemes as scalable as centralized schemes? And on top of that, expressing all the, all the other benefits of decentralization. Well, I was kind of hoping that Scott would jump in because I, if I look at my crystal ball, Gitcoin is heading down sort of the same road. So these are the challenges staring him directly in the face. So do you have, do you have some insights, Scott? Definitely, yeah. I think that's a, a fair assessment. My view would be that you have easy access to scale when you're centralized. Like it's it's very easy to scale, but it's it's simultaneously, I think, much more fragile than if you had a decentralized system in the sense that like you don't actually have any kind of um, like redundancy against corruption, basically. If like that centralized authority starts acting in some way that's incorrect or against the norms or like is illegitimate or you know anything like that, like you run into an immediate collapse of like that system, or maybe not always immediate, but like an eventual slow decline of that system. And that's what you see in like every country where there's being a government that's being active that suddenly like doesn't really deal with the people or like have like any really connections to the world of people. And 
those sorts of situations tend to be much more damaging than if you had a system that was like slightly less scalable, but like kind of a bit more robust and a bit more like functionally um, kind of um, accountable, I suppose. So I, I think there's trade-offs in those models, like between like how much executive function do you have and like how much sort of legislative function do you have and so forth. But like, I think one of the things we've learned from, and like the reason that like, I think democracies sort of are, are the prominent like sort of examples of, of governments that we have today is, is not because like they're perfect options. It's because like, they're like kind of the least bad option and they kind of aren't great, but like they kind of work and like, we don't have a better in, in my mind option at the moment. I think a really, um, it's got which will trigger something for me, which is um, also in thinking about centralized systems, if you could develop you know, partially centralized systems that have some level of checks and balances, like we think about government and there are three different branches of government um, and the courts, you know, watch Congress and the president watches the court, you know, executive, um, judicial and congressional is the third. But um, can we do something similar with uh, DAOs and the corporation, similar thing, you know, board members and then executives. Um, so some level of oversight and then, and then shareholders as well um, have certain rights too. So in this is something that Justine wrote about in part was um, when we're thinking about completely, uh, like for, for instance, maybe one extreme being token holders making every decision about how mm -hmm. a treasury is used. And so um, instead of having a treasury management committee, which specializes in thinking really critically about every decision made, should we diversify and, and invest in a certain amount of stable coins and invest in a certain amount of uh, tokens from other protocols, et cetera, you have the entire community making decisions. And so we could easily say, okay, that's not incredibly scalable. And then when we think about other functions too, like legal, for instance, if at some point you need to think about, okay, we're diversifying our treasury, what are the tax consequences of doing that? Who is the counterparty who's going to pay the IRS because they're going to be coming for us eventually? If you have a you know, decentralized community, who is getting the memo from the lawyer? Because all of a sudden it's no longer privileged or confidential um, and it could be used as evidence against you. So there are just a number of different ways that it can be very problematic to be fully decentralized in, in the way the, wor the world works today. So I think it would be hard deal to say flow. that it's maximally it's, efficient. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But yeah, deal flow. Any, anything that requires some discretion is going to be tough in a down model, I believe. So it's interesting to think about some of those kind of values-based or kind of ideological approaches to governance, but we've got some experts here in terms of actual experience of, of dowing and, you know, trying to do decentralized governance. What are some of the challenges um, or uh, strengths that are emerging in, in your personal experiences? Not to uh, jump in again, but one thing that actually really came up from that last comment was it's funny because we did run into a very similar um, example of that problem with the whole, there was this whole Akita situation that's sort of emerged in which uh, it, for those that aren't familiar, there's kind of this history of people giving random tokens to Vitalik. And, um, generally, it's not very favorable for Vitalik because he just gets these random tokens and then he's kind of like promoted as part of these like, you know, schemes and it becomes kind of an issue. In the Akita situation, um, it was kind of interesting because the, these original, I guess, like founders of this token had like dropped these and then they had exit scan at some point. So these other folks kind of like started rallying the community and got to a point where during um, sort of the last um, peak of, of, of the market, um, there were just like hundred, like almost a hundred thousand people that were like part of this dog token community. And the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because eventually um, Vitalik gave a bunch of these tokens to you know, things like um, COVID India relief, um, to uh, a lot of longevity related organizations and to us uh, to Bitcoin. And to Gitcoin, we got 50% of the supply of this Akita token. And it was entirely public um, in terms of how the community was deciding what to do with these tokens. And they originally just sort of said, well, we'll kind of sell these, like we'll be done with it. And what they didn't realize is like that decision was being made in an adversarial environment where everyone else was able to see that information. And so what that meant is that like the Akita community responded. There was a kind of prisoner's dilemma of sorts that emerged. And like we had to kind of like uh, the community of, of the DAO had to figure out like basically what does it mean to go from like a defect effect sort of state to a cooperative state. And eventually that happened, which was pretty cool to see in practice, but like having these sort of executive committees um, in place would have probably been, been preferable for that kind of decision. And so that's actually been something that's been formatted into 
the data structure now with these ideas of work streams and kind of like these executive bodies that can make particular decisions while still being accountable to the overall organization. For context, you had, I mean, Gitcoin had been a DAO for like a number of weeks when this vote was going on. And what right. was that treasury <laughs> worth? What was the value yeah, of the Akita yeah. dog tokens? Well, that's a tricky part because like it, people say like 500 million, but it was not worth that much because really uh, the, the spot price of this sort of thing was not the same as liquidity. Liquidity was very low. It was maybe in the range of five, five million, uh, 10 million. But to your point, it's a lot of money for a doubt, like has just like come into existence to be like, how are we supposed to manage this treasury? What are we doing? And so it was certainly like, I was actually surprised that it even got to a point where it was something meaningful done with those, like given that it was like a two week thing, none of these, uh, the stewards, the sort of representative democracy system that was put in place based on this retroactive distribution. And uh, eventually the stewards who sort of roughly knew of each other through that process, but didn't really know much about each other, uh, coordinated on this, which was kind of wild to see. Um, but it's, it's a very good case where executive function is needed. Is there maybe a trade-off here? So, uh, in a traditional business, these are decisions that happen behind, in the boardroom. Nobody ever hears about it on the assembly line. But in the, the DAO space, have we replaced lobbying and uh, public appeals and forum threads for, for committee decision? Or, or board decision mm. is that because I, I followed the threads it, they were enormously entertaining from my perspective sorry scott uh when it was all happening <laughs> no no it's seeing it, this all play out in, in public yeah. in education. I, I, I'll, I'll let layton jump in i saw him put his hand up but i, I would just say like i definitely think there's a balance between executive function and legislative function it's a question it's a question of what that proper balance is which is the hard question um but sorry layton uh, go I, I, I wasn't actually trying to raise my hand. I think I was doing something, but, but I, I think I was smiling because at Rich, I, what, I, what I was honing in on what you just said was, um, was that DAOs still have a lot of back channels. Like there still is, there still is like a lot of like, oh, before I propose this, I'm going to like ask this person or like, oh, I'm going to tell this person. Like, um, so that, that's sort of what I was picking up on, Rich. Well, I, I don't want to go down this road too far because there's a lot of interesting things to talk about, but that, that was very early on in the maker development. It became apparent to us on the inside that at some point in the future, DAO lobbyists are going to be a thing. Um, and I think that the ecosystem is kind of waking up to this. And I, I don't think that we're that far away from literal lobbyists like agencies whose job it is to get votes put through in various organizations because that it, it's public opinion now. And that's directly responsible it's almost well I, I hesitant to say it's more effective than in traditional democracies but we see direct financial incentives for votes to occur and that's a very motivating force and so lobbying i think is uh underappreciated how important that is in our space right now uh, the, at this kind of level of abstraction at this kind of strange mapping um uh, the idea of lobbyists isn't going to be super different from the idea of a political party um, maybe in in this metaphor, a party is just a, a lobby um, where uh, um, the participants are also lobbyists. And, and so the literature in political science talks about how political parties exist to um, kind of coordinate uh, units at different levels. And, and of course, there's, there's skeptics about uh, political parties, but there's surprisingly the large literature that's quite sort of optimistic uh, about the importance of political parties as another kind of um, um, kind of agent in a, a, a polycentric governance system doing a lot of coordination work and, and, and lining up work as well as like in, in, in the case of nation states, like a talent finding and elevating kind of role. Mm. You've seen some engaged uh, participants late in, in your ecosystem as well uh, with governance token allocations with various pools as well. Did, did you see any sign of lobbying uh, yeah, pulled together? Uh, I don't think we've seen, no, I don't think we've seen it yet. Not, not in any formalized way. Um, no, but, but I did hierarchy think, before too, if you could talk to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, higher, I mean, I think I have a, I have like an unspoken idea that like DAOs are not hierarchical <laughs> or they shouldn't be. And I don't know if like, I don't know who, if we would agree with that or not, but, um, but yeah, but what I, my finding has been that like, in DAOs that are not associated with like protocols, they become very hierarchical very fast because it's just like, it's just, I don't think we have a way. I, I haven't experienced a way to like organize people 
and get stuff done without hierarchy. And maybe that's just my capitalist brainwashing, but like, <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen it yet. So, um, yeah, the only, the only other comment I was going to make too is one, I think an interesting dynamic I've seen in DAOs is that almost no one votes against anything. <laughs> like it's very, it's very rare to have controversial votes. And so it creates this weird bias where sort of whoever it, it, it is, I think to, to like riches, I think Richard sort of getting at this a little bit, like there's definitely a risk factor of like, the people who are just paying attention can sort of push through whatever they want because 99% of people don't aren't paying attention or maybe 10% of people are paying attention to that 10%. They just don't want to be negative. They don't want to vote against something. So like with pool together, like we'll have a good debate in the forums, but when it actually comes to voting, generally speaking, it's like 99% to 1%. <laughs> uh, and this, uh, this sort of gets a, a, a subtle thing about governance and the rules that um, is going, in, in my imagination is going to represent kind of design challenges. And that's the, uh, you know, we, we kind of, especially for in the governance space, we think that rules are really important. We think of rules as the figure against the ground of possible action, especially if you have a very mechanism kind of focused view of governance, um, then we define behavior in the system by defining rules. Uh, but a funny thing happened to some colleagues of mine who were doing um, actually ABM, uh, uh, so agent-based modeling of governance systems. And what they found was that, uh, you know, they define a sort of virtual resource and virtual behavior, virtual incentives, mm -hmm. and then they define rules. And what they found is that um, rules got triggered actually very rarely, that rules were uh, very um, – Huh. Rules are just there to manage edge cases. Rule, rules tend to be their rule violation and, and, and you know, policy subtleties tend to be there for the weird things that happen. For the most part, the system kind of runs itself. People do their things under an overall framework. Uh, but the actual need um, for conflict resolution mechanisms, for example, is pretty rare. And I, I guess that's encouraging from the perspective of a community that's skeptical about the importance of, uh, uh, or the need for uh, rules and hierarchy that wants to offer a lot of freedom to a lot of people under you know a trusting environment uh, but it's probably going to be challenging from a design perspective because it's going to reduce the rate at which um uh uh you get signal about your governance design hmm. yeah yeah it seems it seems like the um the mechanism for resolving conflict in DAOs is, is exiting like i think that's at least that's like all i've seen so far it's like Whoever ends up oh, with the disagreement a failure in itself, though, right? If that's the yeah. last thing you want, isn't it? People. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but I, I guess I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying what it should be, but I'm saying like I feel like that's the reality. Is like if mm -hmm. it's like the people who wanted like that's like that's like Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, you know, and Bitcoin and like BCH and like Bitcoin and like um, it's just like it's exiting and forking. Okay, so you mean capital E exit as opposed to just wandering away from the table. So like wandering away from your ecosystem would be bad. Uh, well, I do think I mean, of those happen, yeah. just to, to be sure, yeah, like well. there's like a lack of participation is a huge problem in these systems in a lot of cases. Like I, I actually would note, like so far we've had like three contentious votes of like six total votes or so, which is like, I guess a good sign, but also is like stressful. Um, but like, yeah. I do think the lack of participation problem is like a greater problem. And then to your point, like the Moloch DAO sort of like rage quit model is like even more worrying if you can just like people will just go off and create their own like splinters and splinters and splinters. Um, so I think it's very important to like, I guess like the, the corollary of that is like think through, um, you know, rules carefully and think through like how you ensure participation carefully. Um, like, I, you know, you'll get the outcomes you design the incentives for, I guess, in some fashion. Sorry, uh, Kelsey, I want to apologize because I know that you have an agenda, but I, I kind of can't resist because this was a huge, huge challenge at Maker, and I would love to hear what Scott and Lane have to say about this. And, and, and engagement is, is basically what it's all about. If, you have a, if you're handing the reins of your protocol, like a, a protocol can be viewed as a, a computer program, and if you're giving the configuration to a group of individuals, strangers, and expecting them to maintain this protocol that has value at risk, uh, how do you ensure participation? How do you get them coming back week after week, making informed decisions? Now, Leighton, do you want to kick us off with your well, magic solution? Well, I, I, I'll first say we went we went into our Dexit with, I was way too idealistic about this. So our theory was like, okay, we're going to give away 
like a ton of the pool tokens that govern the system. Like we gave more to our community. We gave 15% to our early community and we gave like 7% to like the people who had invested in the company pool together. So we gave away like way more to the community. And then we also set the threshold super low for like how many votes you had, how many tokens you had to have to vote and to create proposals. The thesis was like, people are going to be excited. They're going to want to participate because like it's super low. They have tons of tokens and this is going to like really kickstart community. And that just didn't happen at all. So, so that's not an answer to your, to your question, Rich, but it's a statement of, it's an articulation of the problem um, of how I've experienced the problem. I, what I, yeah. So what I have found though, is since, since we did that over time though, a, a real organic community has emerged and I don't know how we keep them around. I think they just like it. I think they, I think they just like, it's, it's maybe cultural, I guess then is the answer. Like we start to sort of become friends and like it becomes, yeah, it becomes sort of cultural and we're, it's like a lot of people who are at work, but they're on discord all day with us hanging out and we're all chatting about the same stuff. And we have calls every single Friday. So we do have rituals. Like every Friday we have our calls. Um, you know, that, that's probably another answer, but so maybe, maybe it's ultimately like, the culture, at least in my lived experience, it's been like the culture and the community that's like kept people engaged and coming back. And like, that's like our cadre of people who really make all the decisions and, and for the governance. One of the things that Ruth Catlow um, from Further Field kind of mentions is like, that we need to be building like cultures before we're building like structures. And I think that's like very true with DAOs. Like it goes back to the participation versus automation point. Like, we need to be thinking about like, what are people participating for? Like, what is the like reason they're part of this community? And um, I actually think, in general, like having that mission is like step one. And like we've been lucky with like this public goods mission that it's gotten enough people into that state where they're re- willing to put time into governance. But I think long term there needs to be a sort of model for like I- I'm actually I-, I might be a hot take a bit, like, but I think it's like you need to have incentivized participation in, in these processes at some point. And I think the reason for that is just, it's the same reason that like you need funding in open source software. Like, yes, you want the people who are intrinsically motivated to do the work and to like be part of the open source software community, but also the people who like really want to do work and like can't in the open source software community are mostly constrained by like extrinsic motivation factors, like money, like they don't have like the capital to like participate in the system. So I think that's gonna be one really important piece to kind of like push forward governance to the next level. But I think without that mission component and without that culture component, um, you won't like an incentives along the you know. That's really interesting because what was mentioned before as well is needing to professionalize some of the functions of DAOs, such as, you know, treasury management. You might want people that have experience in that to be responsible for that part of the DAO. Uh, we've kind of talked about these Dexit models where people have slowly or are in sort of transition towards more decentralization. Um, Connor, are you aware of uh, kind of DAO first models, which is a phrase coined by Kane Warwick from Synthetics, about where people have tried to set the rules in advance and how that has gone for participation? Because I, th- I guess those are the ones that usually incentivize with salaries or bounties kind of straight up. Interesting. Actually, I'm I'm not super familiar with the outcome for, for the DAO first models. Like I worked with a lot of organizations that have gone foundation first thinking about DAOs. Um, and in my experience, like that's absolutely how I would do it if I were to launch a DAO or sorry, if I were to launch a protocol. And the reason being, of course, is that there's so much to work through after the initial launch. And I've probably shown my bias a little bit. I think that there needs to be some level of, of I don't know if I don't really want to call it some level of centralization, but some level of, of, uh, of shooting responsibilities to certain groups um, and also problem solving quickly, um, particularly immediately after launch when you can run into a lot of problems. So I, I would love to know more about organizations that went down first and then see how they do in the long term. A lot of the same incentives are there. I know for, of course, like as Leighton mentioned too, that he, he gave more than 50% of the tokens away and, and I think it's pulled, pulled together. And a lot of organizations do the same thing. Part of it is like airdrop strategy is really 
is really key when you're thinking about that. So how do you do your airdrop? Who are the people that like even identifying individuals that you're going to airdrop to is really important. Thinking about their vesting schedule, thinking about how they're going to be involved. I think what, um, I think what, uh, what Scott flagged too around, um, requiring participation or incentivizing participation might be a really good idea. As of now, a lot of different DAOs, um, those that start, you know, as foundations and move DAOs even just distribute tokens based on maybe, you know, individuals who, who they know or who have maybe like Uniswap use their, their platform before, but, um, or who are part of their, their email list serve candidly. And uh, it would be so much more impactful if you were able to encourage those folks to become involved in the community somehow so you could potentially get uh, you know, them sticking to it. But to your initial question, maybe someone else is better to answer that as to how it's gone for those DAOs that have gone DAO first. But I would generally, I would advise against it having seen how many operational issues you run into. So I think that model works really well for small DAOs. And, and actually, Layton, I'd love your like kind of thoughts on pleaser DAO in this way, because I think that is a very good example of a DAO first uh, sort of model that, that works, at least from what I'm seeing as a member of Pleaser DAO, like it's worked quite well. And I think that the other one that I would reference, which um, almost is like uh, become like famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it in the space, is like Meta Cartel. Uh, Meta Cartel was kind of like an uh, offshoot of Moloch DAO that Peter Pan started because, uh, actually, I think because his Moloch vote failed, basically. And it ended up being uh, the start of like a huge journey, which like has launched so many projects in the space at this point. Um, and I think it worked again, going back to like the culture point, because he built in from the like start uh, kind of just like almost just like collaborative, like um, positive vibe culture. Like, I don't know how to describe it even. It was just like people wanted to be there. It was fun. It was like pretty, like, I mean, there wasn't a lot at stake really with it, like, especially like when it was first starting. And so it was just kind of like, yeah, like let's, go and like try and build these systems together, like, you know, survive through the uh, um, sort of heart of the bear market when like no one really was interested in systems and, and Web3, they were just like, ah, like we're already here, like, we might as well just hang out. And like, um, they actually like were a lot of the foundational part of the culture in that era of like the ecosystem. And so I think, um, I guess that like shows that the power of that one particular like piece of, of DAOs. And I think, I think that like the reason that was able to like kind of work is the same reason that um, models in web two, like maybe on deck or like what we're doing in uh, Gitcoin land with like kernel, um, how those work, which is like when you create cohorts, cohorts or based systems where people can organically meet and kind of have these stand up this moments. It's like why San Francisco worked as a city, I would even say. It's like when you can create these spaces and get really cool people together that like, have the same goals, the same ideas, the same like culture, then like you get a lot of really cool results. Now there's like problems with that model too, which is like, how do you scale that? And like, I think the Medicare tall example is like when it got to a certain size, it kept fragmenting into other smaller DAOs that like had their own like sort of side but related goals. And I think um, that's like maybe one thing to like to note historically. But like in in general, those cohort-based sort of systems are, seem like very powerful, at least at small scale. So speaking of creativity, what are some of the areas that you guys are seeing being innovated in DAOs? Is it around governance? Is it around specific mechanisms? Is it voting or is it much, much broader? I'd actually be curious to get set or Connor. This is something that's very basic. I'll just start it off. This is something that's incredibly basic, but in, in looking at um, like proposals made and temperature checks, uh, almost the, how democratic it is. So like for a lot of the snapshots, you can, it's, it's uh, some random person who potentially has no tokens and maybe admits they have no tokens followed by, you know, the chief operating officer of the company followed by someone else. like there's no, there's no hierarchy or no real substantial hierarchy in a lot of these forums, which is pretty amazing. So um, anyone can really have their say. So if you want to make your name in DAOs, you can just participate uh, in these protocols, which is pretty amazing. It's almost like having access to the CEO of the company uh, at a you know an annual meeting of shareholders. Um, 
and having the same level of access as that CEO has to communicate with participants in their organization. So I think that's something that's pretty amazing and we're seeing play out live. And I think that might be something that changes over time too. I can definitely jump in, but I'd be very curious to get Seth's thoughts on this too, just in terms of like, I mean, you spend a lot of time thinking about these different governance models and like, um, even beyond the space, I'm sure there's ones that we haven't really like thought of to implement. Um, but the two that come to mind for me in terms of just like, I mean, and this is more aspirational in, th- in terms of things I would like to see, um, which are things that we're still working on a bit on our side and the Bitcoin side. Um, our one, obviously like quadratic voting, like having a sort of more distributed form of, of voting waiting. Um, rather than simply token-based voting, which is good, but can be um, captured. In our case, we've been lucky that like most of the distribution that's available to people um, has been given to people who had worked in like you know, either funded grants or created grants or been part of the platform in other ways for like three or more years. And so generally speaking, there are people that like actually also have a history not just in Gitcoin, but in the Ethereum ecosystem at large, which gives them a level of like buy-in to not defect and like do things that would hurt governance. Um, but uh, I think that like, especially for um, systems uh, that don't have that check in place and as even our system grows and new people come in, having something like a quadratic voting system would be really good. And the other one would be uh, commitment voting, which I think is really cool, like giving people the ability to like have higher stake if they're locking up their tokens for longer and showcasing their commitment to the overall system, which I know RMIT has done some really good work on in, in the past. but. Um, Seth, what else have you looked at? <laughs> well, for, for the most part, I'm going to probably pass off to someone like Leighton when it comes to using this, you know, today's toolbox and mechanisms to come up with a creative solution to a problem that a group of people have, uh, like on the ground, what's going on now. Um, uh, overall, uh, in a lot of ways, I see this space a little bit recapitulating kind of a history of organization theory. Organization theory started off... Um, uh, here are structures and here's why structure matters. And then you can very uh, um, uh, succinctly wrap up the whole history of the field uh, by ending up at culture and culture matters. Now we've seen in this conversation already, hey, soft power matters. Hey, back channels matter. Hey, culture matters. Hey, leadership uh, 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 matters. Um, and so, the, and, and none of that is, you know, human trust matters is essentially what that reduces to. So, so dominating this conversation have been the things that mechanism can't do. What's going to happen? Uh, we're going to squeeze, we're going to do absolutely everything with mechanism we can. And there's a fairly, uh, maybe I'm being too pessimistic, but there's a fairly uh, fair chance that all the stuff that was hard in organizations due to that soft stuff is just going to be hard in, in DAOs too. So I'm not super convinced um, that, you know, I want to skip to that. I want to skip to the soft stuff to culture and to, to the science of that. So I, I still have to wait to be convinced that that's, um, that this is a space for that. Uh, now it will be a space for that in the sense that I get thousands and thousands of organizations that accidentally got culture despite their mechanisms. And I get to see how that played out because so much of exchange is public and there's so many examples that compare across, but that'll be entirely at your expense, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give a quick shout out. I will say one, one thing I'll throw out. I do think, Connor, you touched on this. Like DAOs are very cool. And I think we probably forget how cool they are. Like I remember my, probably my first experience with a DAO really was a maker DAO governance call that Rich was hosting. And this is like three years ago. He threw it. It was like, they like would always tweet it out, like starting in five minutes, like here's like Google meet link. And I just like joined it. And it's basically like you're dropping into a boardroom. And you're just like there all of a sudden. And it's like, everything's open and public. And I was like, whoa, this is insane. This is like so cool. And I think now we take a lot of that stuff for granted, but like Connor, you were touched on that too, of like, you have like the project founder and then you also have like, you know, smart kitty cat 666 or whatever, like (laughs) whatever the names are. Um, And they're like debating each other. Um, So anyways, Kelsey, I guess that's back to, that's sort of trying to loop back to your question, but like, that's not a new thing, but I do think maybe that's an old thing that we can forget is new to most people. I think we've just touched the surface of a lot of the kind of theory that's going on as well as the mechanisms and the challenges and and ways to respond to those. I want to come back to this point about 
autonomy or autonomous organizations because it's something that we've barely spoken about, but it's in the title. So perhaps framed around a future and the directions that DAOs are heading, what kinds of futures do you think that DAOs create? Hmm. I'll go real quick. I think, <laughs> you know, I just talked, but I, 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 I my, my thesis on this is it's one, it's, it's, it's up to us. And I think there is a very dystopian, like hyper individualistic way that uh, autonomous systems create, enable hyper individualism. Um, but I also think autonomous systems potentially enable like, a lot more community that goes back to that scalability idea. Like we could have more relationships because the foundation's autonomous. And I think whether or not, not we're like heading towards like the Bitcoin hyper individualistic, like I have my Bitcoin and I live in the cabin in the woods. I don't need anyone. Or are we heading towards like a new era of like social collaboration? I think it's really up to like what we build and how we build it. Yeah. One thing I would maybe note is like, I actually, think still that while there will be things in DAOs that are automated, we will still, going back to the earlier points, rely on participation, rely on people. Like People are at the heart of these organizations. They're at the heart of any organization, really, fundamentally. And I don't think we can fully abstract that away, but I think that we can start abstracting away some of the things that would otherwise distract us, I guess, from the kinds of coordination that actually matter within the context of like a certain goal we're trying to achieve. So like for us, our goal is really to like find ways to fund the public goods. Like we don't necessarily need to be really focused in on like to uh, Richard's point, like to treasury management, or that can be maybe delegated to an executive committee. Obviously, like that matters. Like it's like critical to the ability to fund these things. But the questions that we like actually want to be addressing are probably more focused in on like you know what kinds of things are considered public goods in the first place. What kinds of things are good? Like what are these like general like ideas of the future we want to see. And in terms of um, just structure as a last point, I think the way I'd like to see DAOs um, kind of emerge or, or sort of, I guess, um, progress is in the context of like the, um, the, the Rochdale principles. I'm like mispronouncing that terribly, but the idea of um, kind of like voluntary cooperativism, cooperativism I can't speak, um, I think is very, very relevant and we touched on it a number of times here. But I think that unless we get that right, unless we can kind of like embody those principles, um, we'll, I think, be in a worse state. I and mean, we run the risk, as I mentioned, of kind of having a lot of these DAOs that aren't really, are, are maybe leading us to a more dystopian future. Um, part of the reason that I started thinking more about that actually is just related to um, a piece by Gnosis Guild on Mirror that I highly recommend people check out um, on a, a prehistory of doubt. So I'll just shout out to that piece, the final note. Okay. Well, the, the, the shout out to Rajdale principles is, uh, is very exciting and promising. I think it shows a lot of the, the intentions, uh, at least the people in this room, all of whom have named co-ops one way or, or another. Um, I think where, where, I, where I come out is it's not a question of can uh, can DAOs uh, enable or embody those principles or accelerate um, how, how we represent them. Um, it's can it do it at a faster rate that enables us to just do more of what we already <laughs> uh, are doing or that can allow us to do that as fast rate as it allows us other people to do more destructive or cynical things. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I can say I'm watching eagerly. I can, My last add in this comes full circle is um, I've spoken with folks who are not down with each of the words in decentralized autonomous organization, lawyers who are really opposed to organizations, many people who question whether any of these are autonomous fully, depending on what you define as a DAO. And then also the decentralized piece, like are so many of these treasuries that people call DAOs or critical people call DAOs actually decentralized? So like, just to bring it back to almost our first question of definition, this is a big um, big open question and we're still so early in exploration phase, but uh, something to aspire to like a decentralized autonomous organization sounds quite nice. So I'm happy to keep using the term. I, yeah. And I think that maybe I can put a bow on this because um, uh, to, to sort of follow on to everything that has already been said previously is that, uh, from my perspective, uh, the crypto space is um, 
is inspiring and endearing and frequently frustrating reinvention of things that we already have, but with a delightful improvements here and there and a little crypto or crypto anarchic spins on top of these things, but it's a, it's a discovery and a rediscovery. And if I had to put money on it, I think that what we're going to see over the next few years are DAOs discovering co-ops and then tokenizing and codifying and writing smart contracts around co-op models that are fairly well established. Um, I think it'll take us a bit to get there because when I started out at Maker, I said, oh, wow, this is amazing, you guys. So you guys have a co-op with a token. This is incredible. And they said, what's a co-op? I said, oh, all right. Well, it'll take a while, I guess. And I think that we're, we're approaching models that uh, need to align uh, with how people want to work and how they want to coordinate. And I think that we have a long history of that in the co-op space. And I think that's where we're going to end up. It's just a matter of picking the tools and the culture that we're going to overlay on top of these things. That's really interesting. And I think there's a wealth of uh, both research experience through this uh the attendees of this call today being folded into the space as well as um, on the ground practical experience. Uh, where can people find you and participate in the DAOs that you're connected with? A uh, couple of seconds each as we go around the room. Layton. Uh, for Pool Together, Discord. We mostly live on Discord. So go to pooltogether.com, join the Discord and just hop in, say hi, and we'll get someone to say hi to you. Connor. Um, best way to reach me and keep up to date on what we're doing at the DAO Research Cooperative is just to find me on Twitter with my last name, which is pretty rare. So you'll likely find me. <laughs> Sp Spoliski? Connor Spoliski? Yeah, about that. Yeah, approximately. Okay. Seth? I just put my email as my name um, and uh, you can find me uh, uh, as in fascination, as in to infascinate someone. Uh, that's both uh, Twitter and my website. Awesome. And you mentioned Medigov as well, which I... Um, That's right, Medigov.org. Yeah, how they recommend So good to have it. you. And uh, yeah, any, any, anyone eager about governance experimentation uh, uh, writ large um, online, uh, uh, it's a great community. Scott? The best place for governance would be gov.gitcoin.co. Um, the Discord is just uh, discord.gg slash gitcoin. And uh, my Twitter is just not... Scott Moore spelled as you can probably see in the uh, little box below. And Rich, for people that want to follow along with SCURF or Smart Contract Research Forum. Actually, I'll let Eugene pick that one up. So if they want to find me, I'll be in our chat and in our Discord. But Eugene has some information, I think, about how to follow along this conversation. Yeah, I just wanted to, to thank uh, Kelsey, to thank all of our participants. I really appreciate you taking the time today to share your work and your thoughts. For anyone who does want to continue the conversation, please feel free to check out smartcontractresearch.org. We're going to have a dedicated post to this specific panel, as for all five of the panels that we're moderating there. And each one of those posts will include more information on the work of all of the panelists and our moderator, how to get in touch with them and their projects. So if you didn't happen to write things down in time as they were listening, it, we'll make sure it's all up on the, on the forum post. And we'll also have some more information on the topic as a whole. And we really are looking forward to keeping the dialogue going around these kinds of governance questions that are, are very clearly complicated and have a lot of experimentation results to learn from. So we're definitely looking forward to, to keeping the momentum on there. And yeah, just thanks again. And we hope you have a chance to enjoy the rest of the summit.